And today, Truly Nolan Pest Control staff cutting the ribbon on their new building in Fort Myers. The team dedicating the building to their longtime team member and VP of Commercial Operations, Chris Maher. They say he has served the Southwest Florida community for 40 years, and the team recognizing his work with a plaque today. The Greater Fort Myers Chamber of Commerce hosting this grand opening ceremony. Let's get you a check of your weather with meteorologist Cindy Pressler. Cindy. Oh, another record setting day today across Southwest Florida. So far, Naples high has come in, tied the record of 91 degrees set back in 2007. Looking for some showers out there, but we're just not seeing a lot today. We still have that easterly flow. So a couple of spot showers developing in Collier County, south of I-75 at this point. They're making their way from the northeast to the southwest. We're just not going to see a lot of them. We're waiting for a little bit for the coastal areas of Collier County, maybe in the next couple of hours, but mainly dry this evening and even into tomorrow. So we're now settling into a drier pattern. That dry air heats up more easily. So 90 right now in Fort Myers and Immokalee, 86 degrees in Naples. So it's dropped just a bit for this evening. Partly cloudy skies, temperatures falling through the 80s. Overnight lows will drop into the 70s and the weekend is around the corner. I've got the details in just a bit. The news feed starts with jobless claims dropping to a level that we have not seen since the start of the pandemic. Claims went below 300,000 and they hit their lowest point since March of 2020. Now, it might not come as a surprise that rent is expensive and the consumer price index is showing that Americans paid more for shelter in September. Experts say while the one month boost doesn't mean the trend will continue, there are worries about the impact that inflation will have on what we pay for a place to live. And foreclosures are going up. Foreclosure starts jumped 32% in the third quarter of the year. This comes as programs that were meant to help homeowners deal with pandemic problems have started to expire. The Delta variant is creating new hardships and further divide. A new survey from NPR, Harvard, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation found that more than a third of households have faced serious financial problems in the past few months. The numbers are much higher for communities of color, more than 50% for Latino, Black, and Native American households compared to just 29% of white homes. While some people are returning to life as normal, there is still a disproportionate impact that's happening on communities of color and uh, low income communities across the country. The disparity exists not just with race, but also income. Those making $50,000 or less a year are reporting serious financial problems. That is compared to just 18% of those who earn more. Lower income and racial and ethnic minorities tend to have more of the jobs that may have cut hours due to the Delta surge. They're also historically paid less. Now, temporary government action may have helped, but it's important to remember it's just temporary. I really can't think of anything more tragic than um, lifting a, a family out of poverty for one year and then plunging them right back in. Uh, I think right now Congress has this incredible opportunity in front of it um, as it debates uh, what and whether and how much of these programs that they continue to extend. So many of them are critical for uh, allowing a family uh, and a household to thrive. Now, the strain isn't just financial. One in five households delayed medical care for a serious illness, and that can lead to more serious health issues and expensive consequences. The fourth child tax credit will start hitting bank accounts tomorrow. As of right now, the monthly checks will stop at the end of the year, but the Biden administration is looking to extend the payments until 2025. There has been pushback from some lawmakers questioning the cost and structure of the benefit. Ongoing research has been showing the checks are helping reduce hardship for low income families across the country. Now there is a safety upgrade that is showing up on more cars that's reducing crashes. We'll take a look at how that could lead to cheaper insurance. And before we head to break, we want to give you a look at our Rubenstein Law Sky Fox over Cape Coral Cultural Park. The Cultural Park is actually planning to break ground tomorrow at 10 in the morning at Cultural Park Boulevard. The ceremony will also be streamed on the city's Facebook page so you can catch it there. But hopefully you get to get out and enjoy this beautiful view in Southwest Florida. We'll be right back. You're watching Fox 4 News at 5. People's lives have been destroyed by this virus. Surviving is just the first hurdle. A group of moms is giving a voice to thousands of people who are living with lingering symptoms long after recovering from COVID-19. 
In their search for answers, Amanda Brandeis explains how survivors are helping fill the gaps in the science. Hi everyone, this is day eight of my Corona journal. And no one thinks that they're going to be the first one on their block to get the plague, but you know, life happens fast. In March, 2020, Diana Barron shared her story in hopes of helping the greater good. This is what I have been using to recover. From I realized that I was going to be among the first survivors. I am going to be participant number 0001 at Columbia Presbyterian effort to recruit survivors to donate their blood and plasma. During her 18-day quarantine, she launched Survivor Corps, a grassroots movement mobilizing coronavirus survivors to donate plasma and support research. As a survivor, I had built this internal hazmat suit that I could share with other people and it was incredibly powerful. And so but she later described this badge of honor as a ticking time bomb. Going in for a CAT scan. Her COVID right. symptoms lingering weeks after recovering and new ones appearing. Maybe by the middle of April, we knew surviving COVID did not mean recovering from COVID. Her network for survivors became a refuge for long COVID sufferers. It's not brain fog, it's cognitive dysfunction. The people who suffer the fatigue describe it is like literally being hit by a bus and then rolled over by a train. Thousands gone. living with Program debilitating started. symptoms after recovering from the virus. It took a small group of suburban moms, basically, who were Zoom schooling on the side to come together. Taking survivor stories to the scientific community, they now have a seat at the table. We act as a subject matter expert to the White House Task Force, to the CDC, to the NIH. I sit on the NIH's Recover Committee. Their advocacy launching research studies at institutions like Yale. To really study what is happening to the long COVID patients. But while Congress approved more than a billion dollars to study long COVID, patient advocates are calling for more urgency to get the funding in the hands of researchers. There are scientists throughout the United States who are trying to do research, and they're saying we can't do anything because we are waiting for the NIH to distribute funds. Last month, the agency announced plans to build a national study population. More than 100 researchers will get funding for the large-scale effort. We're there to give them signals, to give them signs of what's going on, of what people are suffering from. But they need to do the real science. People are losing hope, and that is not an okay place to be at this stage. After 20 months, the Survivor Corps could be the epicenter of hope. Her network of survivors seeking refuge grows larger. What keeps me going is that we're making a tremendous amount of progress. People are listening to us. We are changing the discourse. I'm Amanda Brandeis reporting. Cumulus clouds today are trying to produce some spot showers. This one actually produced some drizzle here in the Cape for about five seconds today, and that was about it. So mainly a dry day, very warm temperatures, actually hot. Let's call it hot with dew points in the lower 70s. That allowed the air to heat up, so we already tied the record in Naples of 91 degrees, waiting to see what Fort Myers comes up with when that uh, climatolog uh, climatological summary comes out. We're forecasting a high tomorrow of 92, and that would tie the record again. This one to be a page field and then temperatures will back off by next week. So that's when our break is going to come. We're waiting on a weak cold front to come in this weekend. But right now it's 90 degrees at page. It's 88 in Everglades City, 91 in Arcadia. Dew points actually have dropped to the upper 60s now right now in uh, page. So that's pretty good. That's feeling pretty good out there. Uh, relative humidity also a lot uh, a lot lower today. So yes, that dry air is really there and it's working its way in, getting stronger and stronger. East northeasterly flow. We got a little bit of an onshore flow now kicking in around Sarasota County and Lee County. So we'll watch those areas too for a spot shower. But at this point, not much of anything. Collier is it. A couple of spot showers trying to develop near I-75 to the south. They're moving toward the Gulf of Mexico. So that's about it. We do still have that dry air in place aloft even though it looks a little milky out there it's dry and as far as any forecast showers very minimal maybe down around Everglades City this evening at least our guidance is pointing 
that direction. Tomorrow, I think even less of a chance for any showers at all. If you do get a spot shower, maybe around Lake Okeechobee at Clewiston, less likely here close, closer to the coastal areas, so it's going to be a dry Friday. Forecast temperatures tomorrow back into the uh, lower 90s, and we're expecting a high around 92, and if we get that, we would tie the record high. This weekend will be hot and dry as well. Look at that Saturday 91, Sunday 90 degrees. Sunday is the day the cold front is actually going to slide into Florida. Will that make a difference? I think it will bring drier air, so that'll feel better. As far as this evening, though, partly cloudy skies, temperatures in the 80s, so it is still warm. We're not expecting any spot showers, really. And as we head through Friday into the weekend, drier in place. Next week, your changes. I've got those coming up. It's not something people typically think about when getting a car, but the headlights and how well they light up on the road might be one of the most important safety features. The big takeaway we found is that compared to vehicles with poor rated headlights, those with good ratings had 20% fewer crashes at night per mile traveled. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety has been testing and rating headlights since 2016. When they first started, only about 4% of vehicles received a good rating. Now that number's around 30%. And now for the first time, they know that not only do better rated lights let you see farther, but they also reduce nighttime crashes. They discovered this by looking at police crash reports and comparing them to the headlight ratings of vehicles involved. Now, while there is no direct insurance discount for Higher rated headlights indirectly it could lead to reduced rates because of fewer crashes better headlights aren't just about the brightness of the bulb the big challenge there is getting the light in the right places so you can design a very bright headlight but if it's not aimed well on the vehicle you know that could just be shining in the eyes of other drivers or even up in the trees or something Manufacturers have had to change how they put the headlights on vehicles during production to make them more effective. They have done this on their own. Federal regulation doesn't specify how the headlights on vehicles have to be positioned. Now, if you are driving an older car, swapping from halogen to LED headlight bulbs could help. Also, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety says people underuse their high beams. You can find the vehicles with the highest safety and headlight ratings at IIHS.com. We know driving in bad weather is more dangerous, but it can also impact a car's safety features. AAA found in experimenting simulating rain, bugs, and even just dirt that features like automatic braking and lane assist may not work as well. Their warning to drivers is not to over rely on those safety systems. New rules could soon be in place to better protect consumers' money from unexpected travel delays. Now, when COVID stopped cruises from sailing, many people ended up with credits instead of cash back. The Federal Maritime Commission has come up with new rules that give passengers more refund options. Now, as we go ahead and we start cruising again, uh, I believe that this consumer confidence rule is essential to us never going through this again. If approved, cruise lines would have to give refunds within 60 days of cancellation or a one day or longer delay. Also, if a government order delays or cancels a cruise and passengers would have more time to request refunds, the rule change could be in place by early next year. Now there is new attention on removing gender stereotypes from toys. The impact having those gender stereotypes could have on kids later in life and why experts say getting rid of certain toys is not the answer agent. In our community 411 tonight, listen up. You've got less than 24 hours left to submit your recommendation for Lee County's newest school. The pre-K through eighth grade school is going to be in Estero. The Lee County School District is looking for names honoring historical figures, culture, and people of Southwest Florida. Now you can submit your ideas right here at the website on your screen, which is leeschools.net. The deadline for submission is tomorrow at 5 p.m., so don't forget. Naples cutting the ribbing on a new charter school today. This is the Naples Classical Academy serving students in North Naples. The ceremony took place today, but students started their first day back in August. Right now, the school offers kindergarten through 10th grade instruction. So doesn't this look so beautiful? And they plan to add 11th and 12th grade within the next two years. Chris. 
The U.S. is still working on getting U.S. citizens, residents, and visa applicants out of Afghanistan. The State Department says it will start evacuation flights by the end of the year. There are still thousands who have been left behind since those chaotic final weeks of the U.S. presence in Afghanistan. A new problem for Boeing. The company is now dealing with a defect on its 787 Dreamliner. Now, this plane has had multiple slip ups in its production. Experts say the new problem with titanium parts has left Boeing with $25 billion of jets in inventory. Inflation continues to rise and at the wholesale level, inflation went up 8.6% in September. That is the largest boost since it started being tracked month to month back in 2010. Now, many of us can imagine just how difficult it is to be an educator right now. Tomorrow, what new numbers show us about just how many teachers are throwing in the towel? But still to come today, we all know about CO2, but another major greenhouse gas affecting climate change is methane, and it can be hard to trace. We'll talk about the new research looking into the role that fracking may be playing. In an effort to repeal one of Florida's most controversial new laws, why some lawmakers say it's a step back in rights for trans women. We'll be right back. You're watching Fox 4 News at 5. Live from Southwest Florida, you're watching Fox 4 News at 5. And thank you for joining us for Fox 4 News at 530. I'm Shari Armstrong, and we're glad you're with us. There is now a growing effort to repeal one of Florida's most controversial new laws, the Fairness in Women's Supports Act. The policy prevents trans women from competing in public middle school to college level women's sports. Now it uses a certificate issued at or near a person's time of birth to determine gender. Senator Gary Farmer calls the law disgraceful and has filed Senate Bill 212, excuse me, the Let Kids Play Act to remove the restriction. Now Farmer telling us he's hopeful pressure from the upcoming election and months of reflection will have softened enough members of the GOP majority to give his idea some traction. Call me a little bit idealistic, but I I'm counting on a, a level of conscience uh, coming to some people. Now, Republican backers of the bill have yet to comment on the repeal effort. In April, Representative Kaylee Tuck, who sponsored the act, told U.S. Florida needed the policy to ensure women could compete on a level playing field. She said she wanted to, quote, make sure they don't become sideline spectators of their own sports. Chris. The news feed starts with COVID cases headed in the right direction. The U.S. is averaging fewer than 100,000 new cases a day. This is the first time since early August that the number has been this low. And while COVID cases drop in the U.S., the amount of people dying from tuberculosis is going up for the first time in a decade across the world. The World Health Organization says the pandemic is leading to fewer people being tested for TB. 1.5 million people died from that disease last year across the world. Now, if you go through security at the airport, there is a good chance that one of the officers is not vaccinated. TSA says 40% of its employees are unvaccinated. There is a November 22nd deadline for all employees with the TSA to be fully vaccinated. The agency says there is a plan in place in case they do end up having a staff shortage. Now, fracking has been a hot topic of debate in the U.S. for years. Supporters think it's good for the economy, while opponents think it is bad for the environment. The research around its impact still needs more work, and Dan Grossman caught up with a few researchers who just completed testing, looking at how much methane is playing into the climate crisis. It's travel day and Phil Stratton is getting ready to fly eight hours from Colorado to Chicago to DC. It's a long journey with a lot of precious cargo. No, not this stuff. So on the top, we are measuring nitrogen dioxide, NO2, a criteria pollutant with the EPA. The data gathered from using this stuff. Um, it uses um, cavity attenuated phase shift. So it has a laser in the back and it sends out a very um, regulated square pulse wave. We don't need to tell you Phil is smart. So this is an instrument called a proton transfer reaction mass spectrometer. Same with his colleague, Abigail Koss, who is also working to, in layman's terms, understand how much harmful gas is being emitted from fracking sites nationwide. We think of using natural gas as a bridge fuel. So what that means is it's a cleaner burning um, type of fossil fuel 
so we can move away from dirtier fuels like coal, for instance. We all know about CO2, but another major greenhouse gas affecting climate change is methane. It can come from a multitude of sources, landfills, livestock, land use, and fracking, and that can make it hard to trace. Enter Phil, Abigail, and their equipment. Among other compounds, it works to detect ethane, a short-lived gas only emitted along with methane when that methane comes from fracking. Being able to delineate this in real time with fast measurements on, on the order of one second is really important. Alan Fried is a senior researcher at the University of Colorado and is heading the research. He says by measuring methane from fracking and other greenhouse gases, we can learn more about fracking's impact on our atmosphere and adjust the practice accordingly as the data collected will be sent to local health departments. It's important to our immediate health. I know there's uh, major concerns about what we're breathing from fracking operations and, and they're still trying to study some of the long-term effects of some of the emissions. Even if you're relatively healthy, going out and exercising on a high pollution day where there's a lot of precursors that produce ozone could be detrimental. This is all done as we move away from coal and toward cleaner energy sources. Natural gas produces around 50% fewer emissions than coal. But Alan and his team hope to reduce that even further once they get this data back to D.C. I'm Dan Grossman. Most fracking companies defend the safety of the practice, saying it is cleaner than coal. Also, they say it does not contaminate drinking water like some claim, and they say that it's helped the U.S. economy become energy secure for the next 100 years. So many of us have had our mental health impacted during this pandemic. We're gonna show you an app that could help you detect feelings that you may not realize you have, how it uses the sound of your voice and the studies that appear to back it up. It's Thursday, but you know me, we are talking about the weekend. It is never too early to talk about the weekend. And the third annual Culture Fest returns. This will be at Fisherman's Village in Punta Gorda on October 16th from noon to four in the afternoon. You can enjoy some live music, a little dancing, some international vendors and other family activities. So get ready. That is going on this Saturday. And one of our area's most beloved events returns to Charlotte County this weekend. The Florida International Air Show is back in Punta Gorda. This is Chief Meteorologist Derek Beasley, like one of his favorite events. Air Force pilots will fly historic World War II airplanes across the Charlotte Harbor. It really is amazing to see. And while you're watching this, you can enjoy some food trucks, some performances, and a bunch of other activities, they tell us. The event runs from Saturday to Sunday, and the doors open at 9 in the morning. And if you'd like to get your tickets, you can go to FloridaAirShow.com. And it's time to race through the waters. Roar Offshore's Poker Run is back this weekend for the second year in a row. I know a lot of you guys are so excited about this. The competition includes two groups of boats racing through the Gulf of Mexico, Charlotte Harbor, and the Caloosahatchee River. You can watch the boating competition from the balconies of the Westin Cape Coral Resort at Marina Village. It's absolutely beautiful. It's a cool event. Definitely check it out this weekend. Chris. An asteroid bigger than the Great Pyramid of Giza, measuring about 525 feet, will be passing by Earth tomorrow. Now, for space standards, it's considered to be a close encounter, but the giant rock will still be about 3.6 million miles away. Now, this isn't the first time an asteroid has gotten this close to our planet, but it is getting attention because of its size. Most of them zip by our planet without any incident, <clears throat> but they are a wake up call to the future so that in the future, if we don't discover those objects early enough to be able to do something about it, they could collide with our planet and cause damage. Again, the chance of that happening anytime soon is slim. An even bigger asteroid is expected to get closer to Earth next week. However, space experts still say these asteroids won't be visible to the naked eye. Advanced amateur astronomers can do that uh, from their backyard. They would need to have some means of tracking those objects. It is possible. It is not trivial by any means. And I know of some school kids, high school kids, that actually have done that.
Now, there will be an asteroid that everyone can see passing by in 2029. Apophis is about the size of the Empire State Building. It makes a trip past Earth about once a decade. But when it comes by in eight years, it will only be 20,000 miles away. In comparison, the moon is 238,000 miles away. Now, this won't pose any real threat in 2029, but NASA says there is a chance the asteroid could hit Earth a hundred years from now. The space expert that we spoke with says continuing to track that asteroid will be key in protecting people if it does become an issue. Now, the house call that is making a bit of a comeback, but with a high tech twist. It's a way for patients to really feel safe and they can heal in an environment that is their own. They can heal in their own bed. How much it will cost if you want the doctor to come to you. Tied at Page Field, 92 degrees today. So what are the odds we'll do it again tomorrow? I'll let you know. Today, authorities deploying a human remains detection canine unit again in the search for Brian Laundry. Now, this type of unit's already been used several times in the past month in the search for Laundry at the Carlton Reserve, just to the north of us. Now, Laundry returned to Florida without his fiance Gabby Petito after their cross-country trip. Petito's body was found in Wyoming last month, and experts say her cause of death is homicide by strangulation. Well, family and friends celebrated the life of 19-year-old Mia Mercano this afternoon during her funeral service in Cooper City. Many remembering the Central Florida College student as vibrant and many calling her an angel. Mia's body was found eight days following her disappearance in Central Florida. Well, authorities in Orlando have arrested Alex Murdaw on two charges of obtaining property by false pretenses. Now, those charges come from a South Carolina investigation into the misappropriation of settlement funds and the death of Gloria Satterfield, his family's housekeeper, who allegedly died as a result of a fall in 2018. Well, Murdaw captured national attention this summer after police discovered the bodies of his wife and his son on their South Carolina property. Then last month, the 53-year-old survived a gunshot to the head. Now, authorities say Murdaugh admitted to hiring a former client to kill him so his son could collect a $10 million life insurance payout. Murdaugh's former law firm is also suing him for stealing money from clients, and Florida authorities are expected to extradite him to South Carolina for a bond hearing. Well, a Cape Coral man will spend 20 years in federal prison for possession of fentanyl with the intent to distribute. David Massey was sentenced yesterday for that crime. He previously served more than nine years in prison for organizing a prescription pill distribution ring. And if you're interested in working in law enforcement, K Police has a special volunteer unit you might want to join. The K Police Department is uh, they have their volunteer unit and they're now accepting applications for their upcoming academy class in January. The one week academy prepares volunteers with the best police practices they tell us to hit the streets, checking homes and helping patrol roads and waterways. Applications are available at Kate PD's website if you're interested. And Naples is hosting their Let's Get Back to Work career fair tomorrow. Amazon is expected to be hiring there for the delivery hub in Naples and Fort Myers. Other companies like Walmart and WastePro will also be there as well if you want to check that out. And it is time to bring sand to the beach. A few Naples beaches are getting beautified. It's hard to believe because they're already so beautiful, but commissioners are spending close to $5 million to reverse erosion on three beaches. So this applies to Naples, Vanderbilt, and Pelican Bay. After monitoring the beaches, the coastal zone manager says those locations needed that new sand. So if you visit any of these beaches, you'll start to see a change of scenery near the end of the month. And grab the butter because stone crab season starts tomorrow. If you're planning to harvest stone crabs, the minimum claw limit is two and seven eighths of an inch. And the daily bag limit is one gallon of claws per person, or that's two gallons per boat. Claws cannot be removed from egg bearing stone crabs and the crabs cannot be injured during harvesting. As always, only one claw can be harvested. It's very important. Stone crab season runs through May 2nd. Chris. In-home medical care is on the rise, but as Usher Qureshi reports, gone are the old days of a doctor and their trusty black bag. The house call is going high tech. 
In the 1930s, house calls by doctors were common practice, making up about 40% of interactions between physicians and their patients. But by 1980, it dropped to just 1%, replaced by hospital, office, and urgent care systems. I think that there is a, a real craving for patients to try to achieve care and improve their health care outside of a hospital setting. Part of improving that care appears to be emerging in the form of in-home care, which has been making a comeback in recent years. It's a way for patients to really feel safe and they can heal in an environment that is their own. They can heal in their own bed. This time there's no doctor knocking at the door with a black medical case. Most of our medical equipment is kept in the back here, so this is where all of our good stuff is. Instead, the back has been replaced by high-tech mobile care units. So here's an example of one of our cases here. Stethoscope, otoscope, ophthalmoscope, syringes. Dispatched with a nurse practitioner or a physician associate and a medical technician, they can treat even complex injuries and illnesses in the home. We don't treat life-threatening uh, emergencies. Those definitely need to go to the emergency department. Um, but, you know, we treat anywhere from an ear infection all the way to coughs to uh, swelling. Many health systems are banking on in-home care models that could reduce costs and help keep non-life-threatening emergencies out of the emergency department. Some folks just don't know any other option because the ED is the closest thing to their homes and so that's what they know to do when they become ill. Colorado-based Dispatch Health, poised to become the world's largest in-home care system, now has mobile medical units operating in 40 markets across